This is Brian Crane. Uh, welcome to the episode. Hey, Frederica, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good to be here. Yeah, so today we are going to speak with Sergey about one inch. So one inch is uh, sort of decentralized exchange aggregation application, DeFi application that's gotten a lot of traction. So we're really excited to, to dive into that. Maybe Sergey, just to start off, do you mind introducing yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the blockchain space? Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. So uh, to my person, uh, my name is Sergey. I'm coming from Germany, uh, originally born in, 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 in Russia and uh, Siberia, <laughs> moved uh, with my parents in uh, 1999 to Germany. I'm here like for 20 years. My professional background is um, um, software engineering architecture in uh, almost all fields, front and back end, DevOps. And I'm a co-founder of One Inch Network together with Anton Bukov. Sergey, can you tell us how you came across blockchain for the first time and when you realized that this was going to be a bigger topic that you um, would spend a lot of time on? Yeah, the first touch point with the blockchain was 2012, I guess. I was working in an aggregation startup. Uh, it was about uh, aggregating uh, product information uh, among a lot of uh, online sh shops, stores. And uh, one of my colleagues uh, mentioned that, oh, there's a blockchain and you can actually earn with your um, like MacBook uh, by mining uh, tokens and coins. And uh, I did some research, really, really small research. I did some mining with uh, Litecoin. And uh, later in the um, end of 2016, uh, I, f I found my wallet with LTC and thought, oh, okay, maybe something worth. And I uh, sold it like it was like 10 bucks. And then I started to discover uh, what is Ethereum, uh, what, is, uh, what is the blockchain, um, what are smart contracts and so on and so on. Uh, early in 2012, uh, I I didn't recognize that this is the future, yeah, of, of finances of tomorrow or, or maybe already today. Uh, and I, I didn't discover anything in uh, uh, from 2012 to 2016. And in uh, 2016, 2017, I started to mine Ethereum. I just bought some graphic cards. Uh, it was like it was funny to 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 build uh, mining rigs. Found some YouTube videos. And uh, yeah, these are my first steps in, in, in the blockchain world. And how did you meet Anton, your co-founder? Uh, yeah, um, I was introduced to Anton by a common friend uh, who moved to Germany from Russia. He's actually a good friend of Anton. He moved with his, his wife uh, here to Stuttgart. And uh, his wife uh, was talking with my wife and we met uh, together. and. Uh, I, I talk a, a lot about cryptocurrencies and uh, this, uh, this guy said, uh, I'm not interested in cryptocurrency, but I have a friend uh, who is talking to me in the same way you do all the time <laughs> uh, and almost the same things. Uh, so maybe I will introduce you to him. So he introduced me. It's, it was early 2018. We didn't speak a lot with him, just small uh, chat uh, in Telegram and... Uh, Anton started to to join my live streams on YouTube. Uh, I created a, a YouTube channel Cryptomaniac. Uh, it was in Russian language. Uh, I was uh, talking about mining, about cryptocurrency. And I started uh, in September, August uh, 2018 to do security audits of uh, smart contracts. Uh, I opened just... Uh, project which was looking like a pyramid with a snowball system i started to discover oh what is behind that okay i found a smart contract it was compiled it was not uh, published as uh, open source there was no code i started to decompile that in the live stream and tried to understand okay he could be maybe a bug or some, something like that i had no experience in smart contracts i of course i i, I did a look to, to the specification so as a software engineer you uh, you have, from my point of view, you have to uh, be able to uh, develop in any language because, you know, like if you have enough experience, you can write in Rust and Go. Um, of course, you need small onboarding, but um, it, it normally works. 
And Anton uh, gave me some hints and uh, I, I put it him into the live stream. And since uh, that day, uh, we recorded uh, more than 100 security audits in live streams. Uh, each security audit took like three hours. Uh, we had a really great community, a lot of people, sometimes uh, 1000 people were watching us on live stream. We were like in the top positions positions of YouTube, Russian YouTube. Yeah, this is just our story here with Anton. And uh, yeah, in, in um, December 2018, uh, Anton wanted to go to Hackathon. Uh, I, I didn't participate in Hackathons before. He asked me to join and I did it. And in the first Hackathon, ATH Singapore uh, was really successful. We won three prizes without uh, having, uh, yeah, doing a lot. They had almost no effort to build a small application and got um, three sponsor prizes, one from MakerDAO, uh, from Kyber Network, uh, and from Set Protocol. And then we understood, okay, we will do it every month, <laughs> maybe twice a month. And we did it. We participated on more than 15 uh, hackathons. We won uh, in uh, Stuttgart uh, the Smart Mobility Prize from Daimler. Uh, by um, hacking over two nights and one day uh, without almost sleep, without leaving the, the rooms there in the university where it uh, happened. And uh, yeah, um, we won a lot of main prizes with Anton. And one of the hackathons we came to, to what we have right now. So this is super interesting, like as a, as a semi-professional um, hackathon participant. Um, so... I assume you built a lot of different prototypes and MVPs as, you know, in the participation during those uh, those hackathons. Um, what made you think, oh, wow, this DAX aggregator, this is it. This is what we have to build for real. So um, back in uh, February 2019, uh, when Anton was here in Germany, participated in the hackathon, um, after the hackathon, we have we have some dis we had some discussions. We came to an agreement uh, together that we, we we will build something something what would change something yeah <laughs> in the world. We had some couple couple of ideas. So and uh, and these ideas uh, we implemented on the hackathons. And first we have we had like kind of uh, an airdrop tool for real world where you can uh, print uh, cards with QR code and uh, Merkle proof on that to um, to to uh, withdraw tokens which you got on the conference for example uh, we had some other other uh, small hacks and uh, in ETH New York uh, we uh, we thought okay um, why not to implement and kind of a D app where you as user actually it was an idea from anton to to see uh, all the uh, dexes and to see all the uh, prices rates and to swap on one of the single sources and based on my my small experience before the hackathon where i was working on arbitrage bots and played around with uh, some some approaches and discovered all the Kind of uh, cool hacks from from the arbitrage traders, for, for example, gas token. We can can also come to it later. I, I suggested Anton on, on the ETH New York hackathon to uh, introduce kind of algorithm um, which can split the the swap amount from your source token among different exchanges based on the rate so when you swap a huge amount on uniswap you have really bad rate if you swap a little bit you have really great rate but if you swap on multiple sources in, in the same time you get you get really great rate gas costs were like really small in the time and um we had the gas token as also a help for that and on uh lift uh, the discussion and on the hackathon for like two three hours and came back with the algorithm which we were able to split and find the best distribution among liquidity sources and uh, we showed that for example uh, Liam Holmes from from ETH Global and he said this is the next big thing uh, I was also talking with Vitalik Buterin there and uh, about the idea before I st we started uh, and, uh, Vitalik said okay it sounds great someone else tried to do the same like total I guess he said but we didn't know about them and um, I was also 
uh, maybe it's funny part about logo. Uh, um, I was sitting and looking for a logo. Normally, we just bought a, a logo on uh, on uh, theme forest, for example, uh, on the hackathons. If you have just an idea, and uh, in the same time, I have seen uh, Hayden Adams living uh, like walking around my table. I catch him. I explained him the idea, and he said, well, "It sounds great." And I thought, okay, uh, why not unicorn, but like more angry because like uh, our team was, um, uh, the name of our team was Cryptomaniacs based on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so we were the Cryptomaniacs and we created uh, an angry, mad, uh, maniac unicorn logo <laughs> on the hackathon. <laughs> or I choose one, actually. I found one. It was really perfectly that what, what, we, what we were looking for. Right now, our um, logo is a di- little, little bit different. It's like Android, uni- angry unicorn. It's a good, good, good proposal from our designer. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here. So basically, um, let, let's talk about what exactly the offering is um, for one inch. Let me maybe rephrase it in my own words and you can tell me whether I'm I'm hitting the nail on the head. So basically, um, when I trade on a DEX, um, there's two ways that um, I pay fees in effect. So one is slippage, meaning the price that I'm being shown is the incremental price for the very first bit that I exchange and then the price moves. So basically, that's the slippage. So basically, if there's not a lot of liquidity, then the slippage is typically high. And then the second uh, thing that I pay is gas, the fee to the to the network itself. So can you explain the dynamics of how much I pay in gas and how much I pay in slippage um, and how you take that into consideration for routing me through different decentralized exchanges that you're integrated with? So... Um... Yeah, every every kind of liquidity source. Uh, I don't speak about taxes anymore because uh, a lot of uh, those liquidity sources are just uh, automated market makers uh, and just liquidity source sources. Uh, some of them don't have any front ends uh, because uh, they don't need any. Uh, like there are also private market makers which are working also on in, in with smart contracts and uh, set kind of ranges. Yeah, if you take Uniswap, for example, uh, Uniswap design uh, in the version 1 and 2, uh, it it has uh, weak points, I would say. It's not efficient enough. There are a couple of things like it's not efficient in the terms of um, for, for liquidity providers in providing liquidity and earning on the trades you have. So you, you, you will meet the uh, impairment loss. Um, then you have the, uh, of course, the fees for the transaction itself. It depends, of course, uh, of the environment where it runs. For example, on Ethereum, or gas gas costs are right now very high, and it jumps uh, sometimes to the moon, <laughs> where you have to to pay for one single swap like one thousand dollar. It's uh, it's insane. And then, um, of course, you have um, the price impact uh, or price slippage, you call it. Um, based on the liquidity you have in, in your liquidity pool, like just if you take here Uniswap, uh, the mathematical formula is, is simple. Yeah, X multiplicated with Y is, is equal uh, co- constant. And if you uh, put more tokens, it get get cheaper. If you re- get tokens from the from the pool, it 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 uh, going to be uh, more expensive because because there's less of of those tokens. And um, how one inch um, solve a couple of these problems? There are several protocols in the one inch network. One, maybe basically um, from from the beginning, what is one inch? One inch uh, in in the first steps was actually an aggregation protocol, and nowadays it's a it's, it's a set of uh, decentralized protocols, and uh, it's kind of network. Uh, distributed network of decentralized protocols and uh, we count the aggregation protocol and we, we count the liquidity protocol for high efficient AMM. I can also explain a little bit later about that. So, and aggregation, aggregation protocol save you time and, and, and money and also the transaction costs. In uh, kind of, uh, in, in a case you have to swap like 1 million of dollars or maybe 100,000 of dollars of ETH to die or to USDC, um, you don't really know where, where the best price is because, you know, like Uniswap don't have the whole liquidity. The balancer don't have the, the whole liquidity. SushiSwap don't have the whole liquidity. But one inch it has, yeah? 
So uh, there are like uh, f around 49, 50 liquidity source already integrated in, 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 um, in the Pathfinder uh, implementation, uh, which is uh, run by our team. It's just an API, aggregated informational service. And it provides the, the best access to the whole liquidity of DeFi in uh, multiple networks. So basically what you do is off-chain, you compute how trading on each of the integrated liquidity providers would change the price and hence what the effective price would be and then find me a linear combination of these. Is that it? This is a more complex uh, complex than what you described, but uh, this, this is how we started. Yeah. We uh, calculated based uh, on, on the math uh, the best distribution among liquidity sources by getting into account of the uh, uh, price slippage, which happens uh, based on the amount you, you swap on each liquidity source. And uh, we also introduced by uh, the uh, taking into account of gas costs as well a little bit later after the start of the, of the uh, protocol back in 2019. Do you mind sharing? So you mentioned also liquidity protocol. What's the liquidity protocol? Is that you guys creating your own uh, AMM and, and sort of adding uh, a service on that level? So our team is uh, mission driven. Uh, on fast moving team uh, and we don't like to copy someone and so on like Sushi did with Uniswap. We uh, had some discussions in the team last year in summer 2020 and we, we came to, to, to the idea how can we solve additional problem in DeFi space. So the first problem which we solved with one inch uh, aggregation protocol back in May 2019 on the hackathon. We combined all small liquidity pools in, into a, a single one and provide the best, highest uh, accessible liquidity on the market by using algorithms. And in uh, summer 2020, we came to the idea how to uh, cut the earnings from arbitrage traders and let the liquidity providers earn much more. And in the same step, we recognized uh, that we solve the additional problem, the um, front-running attack problem, which happens all the time on Uniswap, SushiSwap, Balance, and other protocols, which are not protected. I have seen a Twitter post uh, last week. Uh, someone uh, really analyzed it and found a guy who do all the time front-running, sandwich front-running attacks. How that works is if you swap on Uniswap, like, Vitalik did. Uh, Vitalik uh, had Ethereum and he needed uh, USDC uh, to, uh, I, I guess he, uh, he sent the money to a charity company or something like that. So and Vitalik swapped like uh, $100,000 uh, in ETH to USDC. And in uh, the front end of Uniswap, there's a default settings of, uh, I guess, one percentage of pri maximal price impact. So when you swap Uniswap, you agree for rate which is below um, the, the the return amount what you see in the, in the interface by one percentage so we have the similar settings uh, on, on our front end you can also set zero on our front end you can set 0 0.1 based on the architecture and and and, and uh, of, of the dexes and the uh, ethereum uh, machine you, you need to do that because someone can be faster than you and uh, change the rate a little bit and you can maybe get less than expected. So that's why you need this uh, like one percentage price impact. And when the Vitalik swapped uh, with one percentage, yeah, the front runner recognized his transaction. And what, what can happen if the Vitalik would get still the same potentially, yeah? What, what he has uh, seen in the front end, the front runner can still swap before him and swap after him and take the one up to one percentage of the price impact. And uh, it's a lot of money, really a lot of money. And we were able to mitigate it. We uh, introduced uh, virtual balances. Uh, Vitalik was working, uh, was talking about that already back in 2017. Uh, in one of his uh, blog, blog posts or discussions, I guess it was discussion. And uh, actually, we solved the problem with the earnings uh, of the liquidity providers. We improved the uh, efficiency of the, of, the, of the automated market maker. In the same step, we, by introducing virtual balances, we uh, just uh, eliminated uh, front running on, on the uh, one inch liquidity protocol. Can you describe how this works in detail? Uh, yes, uh, I can. Yeah. 
I already said we, we call it first Muni Swap. Like this was just fun, and we launched it like uh, we we had one week of work uh, in in the code and one one half weeks of uh, security audit from uh, some some auditors, and then we released it just um, and how this works. It's uh, it's like that does do that that you have virtual balances, and if you have a swap with ten uh, percent price slippage, for example. Vitalik swap one hundred thousand uh, um, dollar in ETH to USDC, and the price impact, um, the rate is is worse by ten percentages. Yeah, then uh, these ten percentages are going going uh, going to, to be sold uh, by the automated market maker by the protocol in the reverse direction for a bad rate. And the rate improves in time. This is um, similar. Um, um, actually, t- t- today I explained the same to CoinDesk uh, Korea uh, in an interview. Uh, this is like a spread. If you look uh, on the spread on the centralized exchanges, so U- Uniswap is uh, like a really tight uh, uh, spread be- between um, both sides. And in our case, the spread is growing. If you have this uh, price slippage, and it's um, re- reducing the size uh, in time. So that means it's like an act- auction, uh, which happens in the reverse direction. And uh, by that, uh, we create a competition between arbitrage traders and every arbitrage trader would uh, try to, to make a trade in the reverse direction when it's getting to be uh, profitable for the, for the arbitrage, arbitrage trader. It can be also five bucks, yeah? For example, if by one swap in one direction, the pool got like ten thousand dollars of this slippage. Yeah, in Uniswap, the arbitrage trader would take the most of the money, like ninety percent, just maybe more. And the uh, on our side, we try to sell it in time for for a worse rate for the for the arbitrage trader. So, and that means liquidity provider earn a lot on that. So, but does that mean that the profit that otherwise the arbitrage trader would have made goes to the liquidity provider, but the user is equally bad off? It has nothing to do with the user. So liquidity provider earned the money which is cut from arbitrage traders. Uh, the user have the same situation as on, on Uniswap in, in, in this direction. They just swap, make the spread um, bigger, yeah, and the spread decrease over time in the reverse direction. So instead of actually giving your money to an arbitrage trader as a user, you're giving your money to the liquidity provider. Yes. I think I can kind of see the benefit of this, no? Because if you give it to the liquidity provider, also you make it more profitable to provide liquidity. And then if the liquidity increases, that should again help to decrease slippage and actually help the end user. That's a fair point. This is, this is the case. Also on huge pump and dumps, our protocol performs very well since we improved that approach, what I explained before, by introducing a dynamic fee based on the price slippage. So just think the, the liquidity pool, it doesn't know about the market price. It see that someone would like to swap, for example, with huge price slippage or it's, it, it get normal swap like with small price slippage. So in the case of pri- big price li- uh, price slippage, this is potentially the case that the market price moved in one of the directions, and if if it's there a huge price slippage, then the pool can charge a lot of money because anyway, the arbitrage trader would try to balance the pool and would make anyway the swap, but for worse rate than on Uniswap or other uh, other where else. And based on our analytics, and also if you look at our anal- analytics charts of the liquidity protocol under the, the DAO uh, analytics, you will see huge jump of earnings for liquidity uh, providers on the huge uh, last dump what happened like a month ago. That's useful to learn about and very interesting. Is, is What's the status of this Mooney swap today? Is that integrated in one inch? So... I already said it was like a joke start. <laughs> we, we, we tried to joke a little bit uh, direction Hayden Adams and, and Uniswap team. 
because we cr created something more efficient than they. Uh, actually, we, we respect them uh, fully. Uh, they they did really great job, and uh, we didn't copy anything, but they wrote something we we copied from from Uniswap uh, <laughs> on Twitter publicly. It was really uncle uncle, but. Uh, but we, uh, we just released it because we, we were able to do that and we solved an, again a problem. And we rebranded it uh, on uh, the start of the uh, one inch token uh, governance system. We rebranded it to um, one inch liquidity protocol. We introduced the new f f thing, uh, the price impact fee, and we introduced instant governance. This is really a, a new thing, unique on the market. Uh, in the DeFi space, one year in DeFi space is uh, 10 years in the traditional finances and you have to go fast. Otherwise, if you halt, you catch fire. You have to go fast and long proposals makes no sense. Yeah. To set, to, to change, for example, am amount of fees which should be charged in, in the pool. Um, and yeah, just instant governance uh, improves that. So everyone who stake one each token can... Uh, vote for specific settings and uh, the value is the weighted average of uh, of everyone based on the amount uh, of their staked amount of tokens but the the money swap is now a part of one in inch exchange is that correct one inch network one inch network okay so i can still provide liquidity on money swap no, um, if you go to um, so we are we are right now in on a rebranding re process the domain will change uh, one each dot exchange cover uh, actually the whole one each network. Uh, it has the aggregation protocol. It has the instant governance, uh, the token, uh, token staking thing, the, the governance for the liquidity protocols. And we have under DAO liquidity pools, we have the liquidity protocol integrated there. It's not very well designed yet. We will move it maybe to the top of the navigation so everyone can see that there is also liquidity pool uh, liquidity protocol there and if you click to the liquidity pools you will see a bunch of liquidity pools already um, a couple of projects uh, did uh, bootstrapping uh, on on one inch liquidity protocol uh, for example kind of initial liquidity providing i guess vasp did it and it went very well the, the protocol performed very well in the first first um, day the protocol collected 1 million of dollars by 10 million of liquidity. That's pretty good. Can, can we maybe zoom out a little bit and take a look at the bigger DEX and uh, AMM space? There's a lot of um, protocols out there that do a very similar job for the user. How do you think the average user decides where to go? What, what are the stickiness elements? We are looking on the on the statistics, and we uh, as team we, we don't understand why people are still swapping on Uniswap since Uniswap already said don't have the whole liquidity in the market and can't provide the best rate. Yeah, and there's also on the Binance Smart Chain for for example Pancake Swap. There's a lot of people who are swapping on Pancake Swap directly by yeah getting on the best rate. From my point of view, uh, taxes are kind of out since uh, we, uh, from our team, introduced an aggregate, uh, aggregator for uh, for liquidity sources. And uh, the future could be for the uh, teams who just write, uh, yeah, work on liquidity protocols. They will have just liquidity protocol, not the UI, uh, not the uh, kind of entry point for the users. A uh, Uniswap is, the app is, is cool, it's simple, but you don't, never know that you get the best rate yeah <laughs> and uh, gates like entry points for 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 all the people can be only uh, aggregators a good example is uh, here google think in, in the beginning of internet yeah it was a pain to to find a resource and now nowadays you you just use google or maybe some some other search engines I see the rationale, but if you look at the numbers, so basically I, I looked up the numbers before this recording, and currently 90% of DEX volume goes um, to trading venues directly and not, and not through aggregators. So aggregators only cover 10%. One inch gets the biggest cut of that, but if you look at the number of unique traders, that's even worse. So basically Uniswap gets 
for the la last seven days, Uniswap had 187,000 unique traders and one inch at 9,000. Um, so if there's that big a difference in um, the result for the user, why don't they vote with their feet? Yeah, this already said, uh, we, we don't understand why the people still uh, sitting in, on Uniswap because maybe they never heard about the other projects. If you look on our numbers and other projects, then it looks it looks similar. Like, uh, for example, here, one inch on Binance Smart Chain, 4,260 uh, people in the last 24 hours. On Ethereum, 1,572 people on uh, in 24 hours. Uh, Curve, 225. <laughs> it's a small amount, but most of the traffic is coming from, um, from um, aggregators. Also, Uniswap... Uh, volume what you mentioned include our volume as well we dip sometimes three four times in a pool of uniswap that means we produce three four times more volume for uniswap compared to what we get from the user for example if users swap one million of dollar and we tap in a path multiple times in multi in, in different pools of uniswap we can produce three millions of dollars volume for uniswap it's very very important to understand. And if when when we are talking about volume on uh, direct volume for for Uniswap, we should maybe remove the volume from aggregators and then speak about apples and not about oranges. Yeah, I, I mean I mean comparing apples with apples, not uh, apples with oranges. If you look also to to balancer, seventy millions of dollars volume and uh, in the last twenty four hours and one thousand four hundred users. It's similar to us, you know, and um, I guess these are kind of uh, the the real numbers of normal users who are who know about different products, and those people who are using Uniswap, they maybe never heard about uh, other products like uh, aggregators. Uh, but the market is um, will 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 move to to be very efficient, and this is only the way, uh, and this is the way to use just uh, an aggregator. So one, one thing I'm curious about, you know, if, if the things go there and I think it makes perfect sense, right? That if you have different liquidity sources, then having some sort of aggregation thing, uh, you know, provides a better product for the end user. But if things are heading there, you know, where will there be the sort of the defensibility in the mode? Do you think there's going to be around? more around these aggregation protocols or will there still be big incentives to go and create something like uh you know liquidity protocol like uniswap and try to to get a lot of volume there or like how will the kind of market structure change of course uh, community is very important uh, uniswap has really great community big community uh, they started uh really early uh, got uh, support from vitalik buterin and other uh, big people but they, they they can't keep all the people on 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 side because this they are not like um, the the only one single point of entry for the for the DeFi and they don't keep the uh, whole liquidity. Already said, uh, community is very important and the community can stick to you project and uh, maybe after after uh, airdrop what Uniswap did uh, a lot of people love uh, to to use Uniswap because they just got for free a MacBook. We did similar approach <laughs> as of uh, the uh, uh, the foundation uh, distributed one each token uh, for free. A lot of them actually, really a lot, uh, to make the token uh, more decentralized uh, uh, in, in the first in the, in the first release. I guess if you calculate it to S dollars, it was like one thousand two hundred bucks, and uh, now this is like I don't know. Two three thousand dollars at the current price, but we are, we are from team we are we are thinking about one inch. One inch is equal one inch, not more not less. Uh, we don't see any financial value behind that. We see only value of, of for our network, which can be governed by 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 the by the token and can be used also as connector token in the liquidity protocol. So the one inch token, what what are exactly the governance capabilities that it has? So um, we started with the first uh, 
step uh, and that was to introduce uh, this instant governance so you can stake one each token and you can set uh, you can vote for the settings of the uh, default settings of the liquidity protocol you can uh, vote for example to charge additional governance reward what happened also to also get earnings from the liquidity protocol um, when the user swap and the liquidity protocol charge fee for this swap similar to uniswap it is split it and part goes to liquidity provider and part get, uh, goes to uh, to go to those people who stake one each token and do uh, w votes for, for governance also um, there's a way um, for liquidity providers who provide only liquidity in a liquidity protocol they can uh, vote also with own share of uh, liquidity in the same li liquidity pool so it makes no sense to govern a specific liquidity protocol where uh, the people have no skin in the game. Also in an aggregation protocol, the people can uh, vote for, um, for um, we, we call it um, uh, spread surplus or positive slippage. Uh, I, I like this uh, first naming. Um, they can vote to uh, share uh, the, the earnings with, um, with the referrals. Where, where do you see the one inch token going in terms of governance? Um, so I assume you as one inch, the company will minimize your own role? Yes, we are core contributors. So we invented that here with Anton uh, and uh, worked a lot, uh, a long, very long time for free. And um, the idea is uh, to, to build a fully decentralized network of decentralized kind of distributed network of decentralized protocols and uh, the governance uh, process is very important in that case so right now we have how already said the first step did we did the first step with the instant governance since uh, we, you need to move fast you cannot wait two three weeks to s change a setting in uh, in a, in a liquidity protocol it needs to be a kind of instant yeah who has the skin in the game they have more voting rights and so on and so on the second step would be uh, to introduce uh, a full governance, uh, advanced governance similar to Compound Uniswap. We uh, uh, we we didn't have enough time to to finalize it here, uh, and it would kind of make a lot of things really complicated. And but it, it's still required since the uh, DAO should uh, decide which modules modules should be added or removed from from the governance system so right now it's like module modular based uh, we have the one module is the liquidity protocol and the second model is uh, the aggregation protocol uh, in uh, um, in a couple of weeks uh, the new protocol will uh, popping up will 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 join the system two more independent teams right now working on a uh, additional product and protocols for the one inch network. Uh, there will be also additional uh, um, um, announcement regarding that. So uh, here comes uh, here um, one inch foundation in a role uh, to uh, make everything possible uh, to make the one inch network fully decentralized. And uh, for example, providing grants for people uh, who participate in the, in the protocol like uh, external teams. And right now, the One Inch Foundation uh, can decide on adding or removing uh, those modules, like govern governance modules or liquidity or, or other protocols to, to the network or remove that. It can't break anything. So uh, it's not, there, there are no admin keys where uh, someone can steal the money or something like that. This is like written in the stone. It's, it's not possible to, to actually change anything. If, if we have a new update for liquidity protocol, we create just a new version and let the people migrate. This is the way how it should work um, without admin keys. We have seen a lot of hacks based on the admin keys of Fulcrum BizX were hacked because they just deployed with own admin key uh, a new implementation of the protocol and uh, got hacked. So I and Anton, we actually discovered the first uh, vulnerability in BZX back in 2020. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we reported that, of course, but after that, two weeks later, it happened. Someone stole the money. And uh, this is a bad approach. And we try to, to improve that. And in a fully decentralized organization, uh, it should be uh, as simple as possible. And for sure, the DAO should have the possibility to to add 
a new smart contract to join it to, to let it join the network and also maybe execute something on the blockchain for example um, uh, we think to in, uh, maybe it makes sense to introduce a, a treasury so maybe the first uh, vote in the advanced governance will be introduced a treasury where all the um, rewards which are right now collected this is like right now around almost seven five to seven hundred thousand dollars every week what what is collected uh, from the protocols uh, and distribute among the stakers this can be maybe co collected in a, in a uh, DAO treasury and based on the votes something can can be done with that maybe uh, uh, it can be uh, sent to uh, in, in a new team which would be uh, would build something new or something else can can be done with that and this should be done by the DAO the front end is right now um, uh, run uh, is, is run by um, by the foundation since this this there's a no profit model behind that so foundation is non-profit organization and it has only the tokens to distribute it among the people to make the token uh, as decentralized as possible it's 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 impossible to run a kind of domain by the DAO because DAO is not a physical organization yeah uh, if you need to pay for for a domain a real domain you, you you need an entity behind that and for that case we have right now the foundation and i don't think so that it w would change the DAO could hold an ens domain right and then basically if you if you use eth.link you can even access it from you know regular pro browser yeah sure the DAO can can change the uh, settings in the ens for sure so for this uh, again we need advanced governance system and then we can execute from the DAO. Uh, commands yeah on the blockchain but there are some weak points like it can take like three weeks four weeks to to, to change something so you need to quorum you, you need to, do you have an entry entry barrier you need a lot of tokens a lot of money to to create a proposal of course there are delegations there but it's still difficult to create something if you look back what happened with uni i i don't have i didn't see a lot of proposals there and uh, a lot of pro some of the proposals were declined for example to distribute additionally uh, uniswap tokens to those people who used uh, proxy contracts through dharma through arch and through one inch and it was just declined this is still an experiment from my point of view here with the DAO. What kind of infrastructure are you going to use for the one inch DAO? Do you know? Uh, because it sounds like you've given the attention and the bandwidth and the um, latency problem a lot of thought. I guess uh, Compound did a really great job. Um, Uniswap take the, the implementation from Compound. Uh, with we from our side, from team, we think about also Compound. We will discuss it in the governance forum. Uh, so in our governance forum you can propose something and can be discussed and if someone uh, would like to implement it they can that yeah for example an independent team can implement something a new protocol and they can ask the foundation to to join the one inch network and maybe to get a grant it's also possible so we from our side from core contribution side we can uh, do analysis we can uh, do kind of code review and look that everything is good and ensure that there's uh, uh, there are audits and uh, very well audits kind of from open zeppelin for example and so on so we can act as a consulting uh, part can we talk about the regulatory angle for a little bit so um dexas generally operate in a regulatorily fraud space how do you deal with this as a DEX aggregator? Because I I assume you face much of the same problems that DEXs face. So I personally, I'm I'm just a core contributor. I write code here. I talk with a lot of people, make interviews, and I don't run the system. So I introduced it, yeah, with Anton. We uh, we can kind of build it from the beginning, and we keep to contribute on that. Um, Right now we have the foundation, which is non-profit organization, which run the front end, uh, which is uh, partially governed by uh, by the DAO. We try to uh, keep these discussions and uh, improvement proposals in the forum, also on GitHub. And I personally have no not nothing to do with the front end part. So, and I, as software engineer and architect, I write my code and, and deliver it as, as open source. And the Pathfinder? Because that's the other thing, right? That's the other centralized thing. 
Yeah, this is this is a centralized thing, similar to other uh, teams as well. Xerox, for example, they run also on uh, on uh, on API. Actually, the one the aggregation protocol is built in that way that uh, also Xerox API results can be used to uh, to to do the uh, transactions uh, over um, aggregation protocol since it ensures that it's very fast that uh, who provide the data. It's not lying, and also that the return amount that the user get uh, what what they expected. So in in our case, we run an aggregated informational service which don't touch the money. We just provide aggregated data which is used by several parties. MetaMask use it, uh, Coinbase wallet use it, uh, my my Ether wallet use it. The one inch front end run, which is served by by the foundation, use it. So just the way. Is there some plan in the future that this would be decentralized? Uh, is that something that makes sense, or is that something that should be continue to be run as a sort of you know API service? So this is this is already kind of decentralized. Every team can run own API and uh, let it add to uh, to the front end of one inch uh, aggregation front end. There's no plan for us to publish this open source since uh, we had already experienced the beginning. DexIG, Scott uh, just have stolen our uh, source code of the first implementation of the smart contracts. Uh, I provided the proofs on Twitter. And um, they just said, okay, uh, you, you are no one, you have no name, and we just take your code and we, we say it's ours. And this is, this is true how I say here. And this is this is really bad approach. We had no name back in 2019. We, we were no one. Just two Russian guys were uh, working in the nights, uh, having normal jobs in, in, in parallel. Uh, wrote a cool thing which uh, were, was directly used uh, by by kind of. Uh, I was I would say like the the market leader in or or, or like people who had kind of um, higher level uh, in the community. So, and um, we got a lot of shit storm because like I, I published this tweet with the proof. Here's a function. This is one to one to ours. And this is Russian English in the name. And this is exactly what we published. Here's a proof on the blockchain. Here's a proof in the blockchain that you used it after that. Just add our names to the source code that Sergey Kunz and Anton Bukov wrote this part of code. Just do it. And they said, no, you are lying, you are no one. I didn't do anything based on the IP right and so on. We don't, we, we, we don't have to time to waste on that. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. On that topic, I know one thing we haven't really touched on, I mean, we've talked about Uniswap, but you know, Uniswap V3 is out. And actually one interesting thing there is that they do have this license that uh, basically, I think, prohibits others from using it commercially for two years. And, and I guess this is a kind of you know, tricky area, right? Where we have on the one hand sort of IP rights or the hand of hand like you know, blockchain decentralized systems that are explicitly meant to be able to function despite that. What are your thoughts on that? I can just say this is a centralized piece of shit. <laughs> so if you if you look uh this is really bad approach to introduce this business license since uh the the uniswap team act as a distance uh, like a let's say core contributor to a decentralized protocol uh they renamed the twitter um uh, from uniswap to uniswap labs they have now the labs and the labs have the ip rights and the code from one side, I can fully understand. So we uh, we follow the 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 thing similar part with the Pathfinder, but uh, we uh, we argue that everyone can use or uh, yeah add create a new API and 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 offer it to use in, in the front end. Of course, we don't publish our source code. Uh, we have our IP right. This is kind of secret because we we uh, used a lot of uh, resources uh, to to improve this algorithm. We were working with uh, Russian university MGU uh, to improve that uh, algorithm as well. And uh, on a on a Uniswap side, we see oh they say we are DAO. Oh, we have our team tokens, but we will not vote. Okay. And now they develop such a software. And from my point of view, we should have a, a proposal in the DAO 
to add this protocol to Uniswap DAO to the front end, which is run by the team. The team run the front end. Yeah, how I can see they own the domain and they can change the IPFS endpoint. So they, they change the IPFS hash uh, on Cloudflare by them by themselves. So DAO don't own the front end. There's no foundation, independent foundation, which controls that. So and from my point of view, it looks like a centralized piece of software with a, with a fake governance, which uh, aims to, to be a kind of decentralized. There are a lot of investors who can vote in, in this governance. Uh, in our case, um, uh, we have done this advanced ad uh, governance. Uh, it will come, but it will come only for unlock tokens. So that means uh, the first unlock will happen some, some, someday in, in December. Uh, the people who have these tokens in the hand, they can vote, uh, or not, not those people who, who are locked. I understand that, that move. Hayden has fear that aggregators will take over. They have fear that uh, like Sushi will uh, copy everything and they try to protect them. And this is a really bad approach from my point of view. They should run with MIT smart contracts. So like we did it with our AMM. Uh, we don't protect them. We just published because we solved something. And they uh, can get more success by, by doing it more like open source. Uh, actually, we can, we can, our team can rewrite the, the whole code and make it more efficient. It's not efficient enough from our point of view. And we can publish this open source. The same approach, but uh, written in our own words, I would say, and more efficient. Then uh, what do I have from that? Nothing, yeah, from our point of view. If they would just publish it as open source, then they can get maybe from us a contribution. We have, we found some parts where we can actually contribute, but we will not contribute because this is, the wrong license in, in, in DeFi space. But you also have some parts that are not open source, right? I mean, you said that earlier. Yeah, sure. Our Pathfinder is not open source. The implementation of some uh, gas efficient Im implementations on, um, uh, on, on a Ethereum virtual machine is not open source, which uh, depends to the algorithm of Pathfinder. But the uh, the protocol itself, the, the, the main la layer is open source on the MIT license. Everyone can use it. Everyone can use our special implementation, which, what, uh, which we released with the V3 uh, of the aggregation protocol, uh, which uh, save 10 percentages of gas costs by using uh, Uniswap-like pools. Actually, I offered Uniswap to use uh, the, the source code or, or our smart contract to offer cheaper cheaper transactions but they they didn't react on that yeah some parts are not, not necessarily to to publish because uh, no one would get benefits except uh, the competitors uh, and the competitors in that way that uh, they just copy it like dexag did and uh, use it uh, for own profits and uh, earn money with that speaking of profits so there was a controversy earlier this year, late last year, when one inch um, pocketed the amount that prices slipped in the positive direction. So basically, whenever there was positive uh, slippage on on the one inch protocol, um, that went to one inch instead of just giving the user a better price, right? So how did that play out? And um, wh why did you implement it this way? Uh, actually, it was like a bug. And we found out it uh, actually really late. Uh, it it happens only on really huge uh, huge volumes. So and uh, so one day we uh, the uh, kind of uh, the wallet which were, was uh, set as kind of emergency receiver if something goes wrong to like have a protection layer behind that just got uh, additional money. Uh, from from trades which happened in the case that uh, the user committed for a specific rate and the rate changed in in a process when the transaction was already sent to the mempool and the price improved a little bit on a huge volume it can happen that some, some something drops on the wallet this uh, kind of um, earning uh, unexpected earnings we call it um, uh, spread surplus uh, is going to, is is distributed among uh, right now uh, among governance um, participants, people who participate in the governance and vote for, to receive these amounts. 
of these kind of leftovers. They they get it uh, every week. So what, was it like this from the get go? Did uh, the governance participants get this surplus fees? Or? Yeah, they get they get it. Yeah, they get it. So we as team we don't get anything, and uh, so we we got our in investment from from uh, two rounds as team to develop on the protocol, and. Um, There is uh, also support from the foundation. They uh, provide grants for people who join the network. Uh, for example, in the community space, uh, there are people who are explaining people how it works or try to solve some issues. They get grants from the foundation. And uh, we can work very, very well long time with that money what we have. Plus, we got team tokens. And uh, we, right now, team tokens are locked. Uh, my personal tokens as well. And uh, in the next four years, like almost three and a half years, we will get those tokens and we'll be committed uh, for sure. Cool. So maybe maybe let's step back a little bit. Um, so one of the most important issues on Ethereum layer one currently is gas costs and scaling. What's your view on that? Are you looking at layer twos? I mean, you you certainly do, since you know recently you also set up one inch exchange on Binance Smart Chain. So, what are what are your thoughts on um, other maybe more scalable chains or layer twos, and where do you think we'll move as the Ethereum space? What we have seen is a huge jump of the gas costs in Ethereum. And uh, for us, it was log logical step to expand the one-inch network uh, to deploy everything what we have in Ethereum to a Binance Smart Chain to offer uh, the people a uh, possibility to reduce the gas cost for the swap. Since we have seen a lot of volume, a lot of people training on Binance Smart Chain, uh, great support from Binance, who also invested in the first round uh, as lead investor in one-inch. But we had no requirements to do that. We just uh, reacted on the on the people who also came to us and um, asked us of to ex expand to, to Binance Smart Chain. Uh, for sure, Binance Smart Chain is not the solution for the scaling problem uh, since they just copied Ethereum and, and just used the specific mode of uh, staking, kind of BNB. Uh, the solution would be, of course, Ethereum 2.0, but we need like two, three years for that. And then we have to rethink everything. We have to rewrite everything because uh, it's, everything would work uh, asynchronously in a shorter uh, blockchain. And based on of, 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 of this architecture, we have to rewrite uh, any applications. There are some solutions. Right now I have seen a near protocol. Um, they have actually already the staking um, shout out to blockchain architecture implemented in the mainnet with the rainbow bridge, uh, which can bridge the tokens. There are some approaches to make the calls synchronously. Kind of you have a kind of isolated state and you put smart contracts there and work inside of this state, kind of of, of virtual machine in a virtual machine. <laughs> Layer two, uh, it's a it's a great solution for, for but only layer two, which allows composability. Uh, here, uh, optimism will start uh, already uh, May, I guess. We are also looking in this direction. We are uh, working closely with the team of Optimism. Uniswap committed, Synthetics is committed to uh, layer two uh, Optimism, but uh, there, there are some tra trade offs. Optimism is not the best solution, I would say. ZK Snarks is, is from from my point of view. Really great solution from the Matters team. These are our friends. We also invested in uh, strategically um, in, invested uh, in, in in this team to uh, have the possibility to early also join join the network and deploy everything what we have. Kind of expand again. We have deployment on if Binance Smart Chain. If you're in Binance Smart Chain, then all the layer twos which uh, would have the traction. And later we will be uh, ready for um, Ethereum 2.0. And when you guys, uh, let's say, deployed one inch on Binance Smart Chain, or if you're going to go to other chains, are these like uh, totally separate? And, you know, let's say the one inch token, maybe there's another token on Binance Smart Chain. Or is there some sort of link? Are you, you know, is the one inch as a governance token reused in some way there? Yeah, um, so the foundation created the original one inch token physically created on uh, on Ethereum uh, back in uh, Christmas night 2020 last year. 
And uh, what happens here in the Binance Smart Chain? So the foundation uh, created the same token on Binance Smart Chain, minted 25 million of uh, tokens, how I know, uh, moved these tokens to the bridge of Binance. That means if you move uh, tokens from Ethereum uh, mainnet to Binance, uh, to Binance uh, mainnet, uh, you lock on one side of the bridge Ethereum tokens and unlock uh, on the other side it means uh, there are not more tokens uh, of one inch printed it's just a, li a liquidity provider to, to Binance uh, bridge uh, and also for the other um, for the other change it would be the same from my point of view uh, lock on one side unlock on the other side and then it's great I wish uh, more decentralized bridge than what we what we have right now on uh, Binance uh, chain uh, but it is what this is and uh, it works and regarding the governance uh, so what was happened uh, the, the whole network was replicated in another chain so if you stake there you vote for their settings in in in, in the Binance Smart Chain right now and if you get rewards in the Binance Smart Chain uh, only you stake in the Binance Smart Chain uh, matters and you can move the tokens uh, through the bridge in, in both direction. And, uh, you know, at the moment we still have, you know, let's say you have this Binance, uh, one inch on Binance Smart Chain, you have one inch on Ethereum, you know, maybe there's going to be, you know, ZK rollups, like all kinds of stuff coming, uh, all kinds of new chains. And, you know, we are starting to see some attempts at having decentralized exchanges that are like across different chains. So I think like Thor chain connects maybe two examples of that. Is that something that you can also envision for one inch that, you know, you're able to basically aggregate uh, liquidity across, you know, many different blockchains as well as like many layer twos? Um, we can do it already, uh, but we don't see us in a role to play the bridge for like um, blockchain cross swaps um, we ensure that we uh, do that the, the, the protocol ensures that the transaction is done in one single transaction as the trade is is, is 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 done in one single transaction i have seen uh, andre cronier um publishing oh there's a better rate when you use curve to, together with synthetics and virtual scenes and then swap to somewhere else but you have to wait six minutes but you can't wait six minutes on a market pump or dump right so and uh, to ensure 100 percentage protection for those people who are using it you need to do it uh, atomically in one single transaction um so sergey where are you planning to take one inch what are your plans for the foreseeable future so um for the future um we are right now as team talking with banks uh, Swiss, Switzerland banks, uh, for example, uh, and we offer an enterprise endpoints for them for the integrations. And um, I guess other people try to do that. Xerox try to do the same. I guess from a point of view, what what I heard as well. I see I see banks and fintech uh, companies as uh, gates for normal people. For for main uh, kind of a mainstream adoption, we need uh, partners, and this can be banks. More more and more banks in Switzerland they are open for staking compound. This is like if if you look on the current bank bank system, this is highly inefficient for those people who who has money, who have money uh, and would like to put the money on the bank account. You have to pay. Uh, uh, minus uh, uh, kind of uh, APY uh, here to to you have to pay for to to have money on the bank and this is this is uncle and uh, some banks offer you to so, to exchange in crypto yeah like USDC and you can stake uh, on on compound and get you five percentages uh, APY this is great you you don't get it uh, anywhere here in the bank system for sure. So if there's a lot of influx from the bank system, which obviously has a way larger volume than, you know, the entire decentralized space, don't you think that interest rates are going to go down and approach the interest rates of the traditional financial system? Sure, sure. It will go down 
when more people will join and lend the money but uh, also uh, in the same step more people traders will come to to borrow that money so to borrow to speculate to create leverage positions right now you, you don't need any uh, middlemen here to create leverage position compound you have just it's quite complicated because it's like low level i see components like first layer and uh, one of the hackathons would would like 2020 in february in um, uh, in AGH uh, Denver, we we have built a leverage platform based on Compound uh, to create uh, like up to five x uh, short or long position for Ethereum, and it's happening without any person in the middle or banks in the middle, and uh, more and more people will come and doing do do that because they have the control uh, in in our hands, and they can just jump and jump out any time when they want, and they can do it in one single transaction. And this is this is not possible in the banks. If I buy here financial products um, and um, or I invest in the fund, uh, I have kind of uh, to wait a specific period of time, and I, I need to wait when the the market is open, open, and uh, and, and so on. And here is in the DeFi space, uh, it's all the time. Everything is open, and you can trade all the time. I think these are really nice words for wrapping up. So, Sergey, where do where can people find out more um, about One Inch? So you can uh, join our uh, t Telegram, fo follow Telegram channel, um, chat, uh, Twitter. We are on Twitter uh, with one hundred forty thousand people already subscribed. Um, we have um, Discord uh, as well. We have a blog um, at Medium. Um, also, we have a great help center, and we have also support. You can, if you are on one inch, you can on the right bottom corner you can find uh, the support chat, and you can ask anything you want. Yeah, if you have any question. Cool. Thank you, Sergey, and thank you for coming on. Yeah, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter and please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much. And we look forward to being back next week.